All right. It looks like uh, we are still waiting for a few people to hop on. So we will begin in, in just a minute or so. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome today um, and thank you for joining. This is our third webinar in the Restaurants Rise uh, series of food safety. Today we'll be talking about demystifying sanitation in food service. So new procedures and approaches. Uh, we have with us today two technical experts from Ecolab, um, Ed Snodgrass and Casey Struler. So without further ado, I will pass it on over to Ed. Ed? Thanks, Mandy. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, welcome everyone to Food Safety Month. Uh, so we're glad to have you with us today. Um, during this food safety focus month, we encourage you to explore restaurantsrise.com. Restaurants Rise from Nations Restaurant News provides direct access to information, insights, and solutions specific to the challenges the industry faces today. So explore more at restaurantsrise.com and join the community of more than 12,000 food service leaders. Next slide, please. Um, so food safety is a top concern for restaurants, guests, and owners. So a strong food safety program in your organization is crucial to instilling confidence with your customers, which will drive business and help protect your brand. As a part of our commitment to furthering food safety, Ecolab has partnered with Nations Rise News to host a series of four webinars during Food Safety Month. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, through this webinar series, we will provide practical information to assist you in building a strong food safety program and help the restaurant industry rebound, rebound during these challenging times. So today's webinar will focus on demystifying sanitation and food service with a focus on new procedures and approaches. Our first webinar fo focused on ensuring customer and employee confidence during COVID-19, and our second webinar covered health inspections and what you need to know at your next virtual or on-site inspection. These are available currently on demand. In our final webinar, coming up on September 30th, we'll discuss new and emerging trends in the food service industry. Next slide, please. Perfect. So now I'd like to introduce Ecolab. Ecolab is a global leader in water, hygiene, and energy technologies and services. Our vision is to help provide and protect what is vital, clean water, safe food, abundant energy, and healthy environments. And when we work together towards these outcomes, we improve quality of life for people everywhere. We are very excited to talk to you about healthy environments, which is one of our four key pillars. Next slide, please. And now, Casey and I will introduce ourselves. Casey, would you mind going first? Sure thing, Ed. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Casey Struler. I'm a Senior Technical Account Specialist at Ecolab, um, and I've been part of the team that's provided a lot of uh, procedure and product recommenda recommendations related to COVID-19. Great. Thanks, Casey. And uh, myself, uh, Ed Snodgrass, I'm a program leader at Ecolab as part of the research development and engineering team. And I lead a team of technical experts. And what we do is provide um, technical guidance to our biggest global customers. And Casey is an integral part of this team. Um, so I have over 15 years of experience with Ecolab and research development and engineering. Um, and I will say, um, you know, please, you know, write in your questions as we go through this. KC is like an encyclopedia of disinfection, cleaning, and sanitation, and uh, both of us have had a, a very in-depth focus on COVID-19, obviously, for the last six months. So, um, please, now is your opportunity to ask us questions, and we're more than happy to answer them. So, next slide, please. So, I want to start you off with a few statistics provided by Data Essentials, who spoke during the first webinar in this series, to highlight the importance of proper sanitation in your operation. I think this list is very eye-opening. Since COVID-19, 50% of respondents consider a clean and sanitary restaurant the highest priority when selecting a restaurant. They put this above such things as taste and service. And from my experience, before COVID-19, taste always topped the list. So you can see how much things have changed in the past half a year. And Casey and myself have consulted and provided guidance to many food service customers recently. And I can tell you that cleanliness and san sanitation are definitely a top priority for all of our customers. Not only do our customers want to know about standard cleaning and disinfection, but they want to know what's new, what's changed, and what things they can do specifically to reduce the risk to their guests and employees. That's the focus of this webinar. Next slide, please. So here's one more stat from Data Essentials. So it's really easy to think that as time moves on and COVID-19 becomes a memory, that things will go back to business as usual. However, this cannot be further from the truth. The situation we are in today will have a lasting impact for years to come, and as restaurants Cleanliness and food safety procedures um, continue to matter. 
They will continue to matter to the majority of your customers as well. Next slide, please. So as we go through the rest of the webinar, our goal is to answer these questions. If you have additional questions as we move forward, again, please chat them in and we'll answer them as we go. So you might be wondering, how can I minimize risk to my employees and keep them safe and focused? How should I manage cleaning and disinfection of my establishment? How can I disinfect larger areas efficiently? And is food a risk for COVID-19 transmission? And what extra precautions should I take? Next slide. When you consider the risk factors associated with the novel coronavirus in your operation, it's important to understand where it comes from and how it's transmitted. The virus comes into the establishment from two sources, employees and guests. It's very important to train your employees on how to recognize symptoms in both themselves and their guests and to stay at home if they are sick. Once in your establishment, the virus is transmitted by two main methods. The first is by droplets in the air. When people talk or cough or sneeze, droplets become airborne and can get into other people's eyes, mouths, and lungs. This is why following local public health guidelines for social distancing and masks is very important. The second method is by touching contaminated surfaces. These surface, surfaces can become contaminated by people coughing or sneezing on the surface and by touching their face and then touching the surface. This method of contamination is much less common in terms of transmission than being spread by droplets in the air. However, should still be considered an area of risk. And now that, we have, now that we know where the virus comes from and the way the virus spreads, let's discuss how to mitigate risk in your establishments. Next slide, please. So overall, a best practice to mitigate the risk of COVID-19 is to implement enhanced hygiene. Public health recommendation focus, focuses on standard infection control practices, training, and compliance. There are two critical considerations to infection control, personal and environmental hygiene. When implemented correctly, these are a winning combination, especially in this COVID-19 era. It is important to communicate the expectation for personal hygiene to staff and customers. Queuing and signage are a great way to ensure everyone is aware of the need to wash their hands frequently and to encourage physical distancing of at least six feet. Signage can also communicate the requirement for any personal protective equipment on premise. For example, you may have a requirement that guests wear masks in public areas. The second consideration, environmental hygiene, is equally as important as personal hygiene. This is the focus of proper cleaning and disinfection of high touch point surfaces in objects with an EPA registered disinfectant approved for use against COVID-19. Next slide, please. And as I stated, there are two key pillars, personal and environmental hygiene. And now I'm gonna talk about personal hygiene. Next slide, please. So it is very important to train and reinforce good infection prevention procedures with your employees. This shouldn't be a one-time training, but rather an ongoing dialogue with your employees about things that they can do to prevent getting sick or spreading the sickness to others. This needs to become part of the culture of your establishment to ensure consistent adherence to your policies. Some of the ways you and your employees can reduce the risk of transmission are by wearing a face mask, washing your hands often, covering your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze, and avoiding close, avoiding close contact with potentially infected individuals. The next way is physically distancing in common areas. Put up signage where you, where you stand in line for guests and consider putting up barriers between guests and employees when physical distancing may not be possible. Follow local public health guidelines for social distancing requirements. And staying home while sick is probably one of the most important things you can do um, for both you and your employees to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So know the symptoms, and if you display them, do not come to work. Follow local public health guidelines for getting tested, and this will be very different for a lot of places now, because in the past, employees might show up with a cold or runny nose. This is not really an option anymore. This may require more thought to sick leave policy and ensuring proper staffing levels, even when people do call in sick. Next slide, please. I think this is a really interesting fact that I wanted to share, um, and it really surprised me as well. So in 30 minutes, the average person will touch 300 different surfaces. This means they may be touching their face, they may be touching their phone, or other contaminated surfaces, and then touching different areas within an establishment. That can easily lead to transmission of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Uh, so this is why we promote proper hand hygiene. Next slide, please. So hand hygiene is a primary mode of transmission, or, sorry, hands are a primary mode of transmission, so hygiene must be judiciously implemented across the establishment. The standard procedure for washing hands is wet your hands, lather them really well between fingers under nails, scrub for at least 20 seconds, rinse under clean running water, and then dry your hands with a towel or an air dryer. The 20 second piece is probably the part that is most likely not being followed by a lot of people. Um, and I will say that this entire process is required to ensure full removal of soil and organism, organisms from your hands. 
Um, and, you know, when hand soap is not available, when your hands don't appear to be dirty, hand sanitizer is an acceptable alternative. Um, make sure you use an FDA registered um, hand sanitizer in, in order to do that. And you're probably asking me why I'm telling you how to wash your hands. This is probably something you know, but I would ask you, do your employees know? Um, and if your employees do know, that's great, but is it being um, effectively enforced? And I've got a couple of stats here um, that the FDA generated back before COVID-19 even, and they looked at over 800 restaurants, um, half of them quick service, so fast food, and the other half full service. And they found 66% of quick service restaurants that they audited were washing hands improperly. This means they weren't scrubbing correctly or they weren't, you know, they didn't have hand soap available or proper towels. Um, and they were just doing it wrong. That's a really scary number. And from a full service restaurant standpoint, it was 82% of establishments were washing their hands incorrectly. So that is a huge number. And again, I can't reinforce this enough. This is something that you need to share with your employees and it needs to become part of the culture. Um, and people need to be very, very aware um, of the importance of, of washing hands. Next slide, please. And it's not just about washing your hands appropriately, it's about knowing when to wash your hands. So there are many, many indicators for when you actually should be washing your hands. You know, so before and during after food preparation, before eating, um, you know, if you touch a high touch point surface that could possibly be contaminated, you need to wash your hands. Like I said, there are many different reasons why you need to wash your hands and different trigger items to trigger you to have to do so. So it's very important to A, teach your employees how to do it correctly, and then B, understand when they should be washing their hands. Next slide, please. So gloving is very interesting today. It's probably gonna be a lot more common in a lot of customer um, establishments and a lot of restaurants, uh, both in the back and in the front of house. Make sure your employees understand proper gloving. Um, it's not just supplying gloves and then you have a sealed barrier for the rest of the day. Um, you need to treat your gloves like your hands. Um, so first thing you need to do is wash your hands before you apply the gloves. Um, and then when you dispose of the gloves, again, you need to wash your hands. And then the trigger points I talked about before, uh, when to wash your hands, need to be applied for when you're wearing gloves as well. So if you touch your face, if you touch other surfaces, like high touch point surfaces, you need to replace your gloves and follow this procedure again for removing the gloves and then putting them back on. So it's very, very important that your employees understand um, that gloves are a great barrier. However, they need to follow the same protocol as, um, as your hands. Next slide, please. And then I just wanted to talk briefly about wearing a face mask. These are obviously very um, popular today. Um, you know, we're following CDC guidance and local um, regulatory guidelines to understand where to, when to wear them. But putting them on and wearing them does require some specific knowledge. Um, so first of all, reusing the mask, um, they are reusable. Um, so make sure they're not dirty, make sure they're not ripped or torn. Um, and then if you store them, store them in a, in a clean brown paper bag um, and they can be used in the future. Now. Putting on the mask itself, you should wash your hands first, um, inspect the mask for any issues, um, put the mask on. If it has a little metal piece over the nose, you pinch it so it, it contours to your nose. Um, and then once the mask is on, you should wash your hands again before you're ready for service and, and duty. Um, and then anytime you touch the mask, and this is very important because masks tend to be itchy sometimes, they tend to move around a little bit. If you're adjusting your mask and you touch that mask, everything that you've breathed out is now on your hand and you need to go and wash your hands. So very, very important. Again, masks are a great tool in combination with social distancing or physical distancing, um, but there are considerations there for potential contamination of, of hands. So it's just something to be aware of. So um, that was uh, personal hygiene. And now I wanna pause for a minute. Um, Mandy, have there been any questions that have come through that we should uh, address at this point? Yes, yes, there are. Thanks, Ed. That is fascinating about the average person touches 300 surfaces in 30 minutes. Uh, so it leads into one of the questions that was asked um, from someone listening, and it is, when should I use antibacterial hand soap, and is it effective against COVID-19? You know, that's a great question, Mandy. Um, so I'm going to give my input here, and then if you, Mandy, or Casey have anything to add, please feel free on any of these questions. So. Um, antibacterial hand soap are FDA registered hand soaps, um, and AB stands for antibacterial, bacterial being bacteria. Um, obviously, SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19 is a virus. Um, so technically, you're only getting bacterial kill through an antibacterial hand soap, not viral kill. So technically speaking, any hand soap is okay. 
uh, be it cosmetic or antibacterial, to use. Um, however, we do typically recommend uh, for front of house uh, and restrooms to use a cosmetic hand soap for the guests, and then in the back of the house to use the antibacterial hand soap because, you know, with COVID-19 and, you know, we don't want to forget that there are still other organisms out there that we need to be prepared for. Um, and it's just one extra layer of prote protection, um, killing the bacteria on your hands um, for your food service workers to use an antibacterial soap. Awesome. Thank you. And I don't have anything to add to that. Casey, do you? No? Okay, great. One more question came through on proper hand hygiene. And is hot water a component of the clean running water for a fully stocked hand sink? You know, that's a really great question. And, and I don't know if mm -hmm. I know the answer okay. specifically if it's required, Mandy. Do you know that off the yeah. top of your head? Yes, yes, I do. Sorry. <laughs> but I'd, the, um, the, the FDA food code does require certain aspects and components for a fully stocked hand sink and warm running water uh, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit is part of that. So you'll need the warm running water, soap, um, paper towels, and an unblocked hand sink um, as part of that, um, those fully stocked hand sinks. So. Thanks, Mandy. All right. That was great. Yeah, um, I'm trying to see if there are any other. Maybe there will be before we get to the end. So thank you, Ed. I am now going to move into environmental hygiene uh, with Casey Struller. So Casey, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Mandy. And thanks, Ed, yeah. uh, for giving us a little bit of an overview on personal hygiene. As you mentioned, it's really, really a critical component of the overall kind of process of resuming operations and getting your restaurant back up and, and working. So we're going to dive into environmental hygiene. Um, and this is really the focus on those hard, non-porous surfaces throughout your operation. But additionally, uh, in food service, there's a lot of food contact surfaces that we need to consider as well. So environmental hygiene is important for a number of reasons. First and foremost, you know, food safety always remains a challenge in food service. Um, about 20% of outbreaks can be traced back to contaminated environmental surfaces or prep equipment. Um, and that's, that's fairly significant, especially when you understand the costs associated with an outbreak. Um, additionally, uh, you know, contaminated surfaces or food contact surfaces in particular not being cleaned and sanitized is the number two most cited violation. So, really important to understand what products to use where, um, you know, correct application type, all of those kind of things, which we're going to walk through today, and you'll all be experts by the end. And then additionally, when we think about COVID-19, uh, you know, it's kind of been the topic of conversation since, you know, early spring. Um, it, treatment of environmental surfaces is really one of our best approaches to mitigate this risk. So we've kind of settled into this new normal. Um, we are, you know, six-ish months into this, and there's, you know, a, a lot of time left before we'll be all the way out of it. As Ed mentioned, a lot of these enhanced hygiene procedures are something that we kind of anticipate being around for the foreseeable future. Your customers are requesting them. They want them to be visible. Um, and so we don't think that, you know, one day we're going to wake up and they'll all just be gone, and, and that expectation will have gone away. So Ecolab has always provided best practices for cleaning throughout your operation, um, but really what, what needs to happen now, we can give you the best procedures, but you need to have this behavior shift at the unit level. So your food service workers and those that are doing the cleaning um, in both front and back of house need to understand and, and also explicitly follow the proper environmental hygiene procedures. So in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide, you can see the five factors of clean. Those are time, temperature, chemical action, mechanical action, and overall procedures is kind of the circle around the other four. So while these are all really, really important, uh, I would argue the single most important is this overall procedure. If you can have the best tool for the job, uh, but if you don't follow proper procedures, that tool can't do its job. So we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into that today. And, and really the remainder of the presentation is going to reinforce the importance of following proper procedures, reading the label, and really understanding uh, why you're using a product. 
So there are many tools for jobs, as I kind of just alluded to. There are cleaners, there are sanitizers, there are disinfectants. Sometimes these are used interchangeably. You know, a lot of times I, I read something that's been published and I'm like, ooh, I don't think they meant to use that word or I don't think they fully understood um, that, you know, these aren't necessarily interchangeable or synonymous. A cleaner is meant to remove soils from a surface. Uh, so this could be things like dirt, food soils, or other impur impurities that your guests may bring in from, from the outside. Um, a sanitizer is meant to significantly reduce the amount of bacteria on a surface. So this is a tool that's used widely across food service operations. You're probably all very familiar with sanitizers. Uh, and these would be hard surface sanitizers, not hand sanitizers, as Ed mentioned before. Those are two different products that are kind of regulated by two different agencies and they have um, different utilities in your operation. And then finally, a disinfectant. Uh, disinfectants are formulated specifically to destroy or irreversibly inactivate both bacteria and viruses. So SARS-CoV-2 is a novel virus, um, and so you really need a disinfectant to address concerns around that virus uh, and its, you know, the potential of it in your operation. Both sanitizers and disinfectants are regulated by the US EPA in the US, uh, and there are equivalent agencies across the globe. Um, and they're used to manage public health risks. So because they make claims to control a pest, which in, in this, uh, in this you know, time, we're thinking about a pest as a bacteria or a virus. It's not a pest you can see, but it's, it is a pest that's there. Um, the EPA requires that we register those products. And there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into registration. Stacks and stacks of paperwork is submitted to these agencies so they understand um, how we got to the point of being able to make these claims. So, uh, any claim that's on a label is founded in, you know, a lot of data, and our R&D teams worked really hard to make sure that we can actually make that claim. Um, surface disinfectants are subject to more rig rigorous EPA testing, and so they must clear kind of a higher bar, if you're thinking about it that way, uh, for effectiveness or efficacy, as I might mention throughout the presentation. So surface sanitizers are great for food service. They do what we need them to do, but in some instances, we need to up the ante a little bit and move to a disinfectant. So these types of products, uh, you know, it's really, really critical to understand and read the label. Um, I know a lot of times, you know, you buy a new product from uh, your local store and you go to apply it and you think, you know, oh, this is really intuitive. I'm going to spray this and wipe it and be done with it. Um, and these are a little bit more nuanced. You need to understand things like contact time and, and uh, how to apply the product. So I wanted to mention one thing. These products are not for use on or in humans. Um, they're really to be used exclusively on inanimate objects. So we have a different product category for use on or in humans. All right, so as I mentioned, it's really important to read the label directions when using a sanitizer or disinfectant. So the steps listed here in gray, those are the high level steps to using a food contact sanitizer um, on a food contact surface. You've probably seen this a million times. Wash, rinse, sanitize. This is how food contact surfaces should be treated. Um, and a food contact surface would be a surface that comes into contact with food. Pretty self-explanatory. This could be things like food prep um, items or tools that you use in back of house. So you probably, like I said, have all seen this process before. Uh, but during an outbreak situation like COVID, um, you may have to pull out, you know, a bigger tool, a, a tool that has a little bit more oomph behind it. And so we've seen some customers implement a disinfection step. So disinfection step would happen first, um, but since most disinfectants are too strong for use on food contact surfaces or for use in contact with food, you would need to rinse and then follow with a sanitizing step with your food contact sanitizer. So this becomes a little bit burdensome for your staff, especially if you've had a lot of turnover and you have a lot of new staff coming in, or even for your staff that returned, um, they weren't used to this new step being implemented. And so it's really, really important that they understand what products am I using in what order, uh, and if and when they do need that rinse step. So, um, you know, the industry is evolving. Uh, the needs of our customers are evolving, and so Ecolabs is kind of evolving as well. Uh, we recently have launched a new product called Smart Power Sink and Surface Cleaner Sanitizer. And this product is really cool because it kind of helps streamline those procedures. Um, it, it goes from being a three-step, two-product process to a two-step, one-product process where you can use the same product to both clean and sanitize, and you can leave out that rinse step altogether. Um, this product is approved by the EPA, 
Uh, and so in addition to helping streamline processes, which does help with compliance um, in your operation, this product is also really cool in the sense that it has a norovirus claim at food contact safe levels. So we just talked about sanitizers, you know, they don't really address viruses, but this product actually at food contact, uh, food contact safe levels does have a claim against norovirus in 30 seconds. So the really cool part about that is um, in addition to the norovirus claim, we have an emerging viral pathogen claim. And this is basically a claim that EPA allows where they say in the event of an outbreak, you may use your product against a novel virus. So we're able to leverage this claim right now during COVID um, to address SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. And we can use this product in two steps, clean and sanitize. Not only will it be food uh, code compliant, but it also addresses concerns around norovirus and SARS-CoV-2. So again, uh, a great you know, option for your, your operation, kind of helping streamline those procedures and, and um, increasing your, your compliance. All right, so we've talked about food contact sanitization in depth, um, but as I mentioned, disinfection is really the name of the game when you think about COVID uh, and specifically about viruses. So listed here are the high level steps to disinfection. It's pre-clean, disinfect, wait, and dry. Um, all Ecolab disinfectants are one-step disinfectants. So this pre-cleaning step is really only required if you visibly see soil on a surface. This could be food, um, dirt, anything that you can visibly see, we would encourage a pre-cleaning step before you go into disinfection. And this may not be true for other chemicals in the industry, so do read the product label to understand if it's a one-step or two-step disinfectant. Um, the disinfectant can then be applied according to the label direction. So this might be via spraying or through immersion, like through a mop, a cloth, a wipe, some other way. And the most critical step here, if you focus on one step in this four-step process, is step three. You're actually not doing anything besides waiting. So it's really, really important that once you've applied the disinfectant, you wait long enough uh, that you can actually get complete kill or the kill that that disinfectant um, claims on the label. And so a lot of disinfectants have, you know, kill claims or dwell times, you may have heard them called contact times, anywhere ranging from 30 seconds to some as, as long as 10 minutes. And so you need to understand with the disinfectant you're using what that contact time is. And a really important uh, portion of understanding that contact time is that your surface has to actually remain wet for that entire contact time. So I know a lot of us right now may be carrying wipes around with us and wiping down surfaces if we have to travel or um, you know, when we leave the grocery store before we use the cart at the grocery store. And so a quick wipe uh, and move on isn't actually doing what you want this product to do. So understanding that contact time is pretty critical. If you're not sure what the contact time is on your disinfectant, do reach out to your chemical provider. They will be able to provide that information uh, to make sure that you're using the chemical how it should be used. And then the final step is to wipe the surface or allow to air dry. Um, so as I mentioned previously, in order to actually clean a surface or remove soils from that surface, the surface does need to be wiped. So we would encourage um, wiping the surface once you're done with disinfection. All right, so the next question after we talk about disinfection is always, great, we know we need to disinfect, but how often should we do it? Um, and this is really not something that we can prescribe. It's not a one size fits all. Um, every restaurant shouldn't be disinfecting at the same frequency because there are a couple factors that need to be considered. And this is really a risk-based decision. So there are a couple environmental variables that you can focus on when you're thinking about what should my disinfection frequency be? Uh, number one is infection risk. Second would be foot traffic, and then third is soil load. And that kind of goes hand in hand with foot traffic as you know, your foot traffic increases, we kind of anticipate the soil load to increase as well. But infection risk, um, you know, let's think about at the beginning of COVID back in March, April timeframe, um, there were some really like hot spot pockets in the US and New York was one of those uh, that we heard about a lot. So New York would have had a high infection risk at that point uh, versus maybe Northern Minnesota where, you know, Ecolab is located in Minnesota. Uh, Northern Minnesota, there may not have been a high infection risk. Um, and so when you're thinking about frequency, a restaurant in New York City may have had to disinfect on those high touch uh, non-food contact surfaces more often than that uh, restaurant in northern Minnesota. And also the restaurant in New York City likely had a lot more foot traffic and a lot higher soil low because of that. So 
um, really this, this is something that you should kind of revisit often to think about, hey, you know, the risk in our area has increased. More people have tested positive in the past two weeks. Maybe we need to be disinfecting a little bit more. Or conversely, and kind of the direction we hope is, you know, as the risk begins to subside, you can reduce the amount that you're cleaning and disinfecting throughout the day. All right, so we've talked a little bit about application types. I alluded to this a little bit earlier, uh, but there are many, many ways to apply products. Um, when determining the product application, the label is the law. So read the product label and that's how you should apply the product. Um, but also compatibility is a consideration. So there may be surfaces in your operation uh, that are sensitive. And so you need to think about how you're gonna apply a chemistry to make sure that those sensitive surfaces don't degrade over time. So trigger sprayers are the most traditional method of applying particularly disinfectant and also sanitizers in front of house. This is used a lot. And they do work really well to direct a product to a surface. You can sometimes change that nozzle from fine spray to more coarse spray, depending on how much liquid you want to come out. Um, but this application type is really best suited for small to mid-size areas. So if you have a smaller restroom or a smaller entryway, this might be a great option for you. Uh, they're also very cost effective. Next, we have pressurized sprayers. This kind of looks to me like uh, the, the um, weed sprayer you might get at Home Depot or, or some other store like that. And this is a pressure sprayer that's pressurized by manual pumping. Um, this might be a really good option for a larger area where there is not food and no you know, food packaging, nothing is being stored there. So this type of sprayer might work best for like a loading dock to disinfect. Uh, versus, you know, back of house or somewhere where there's going to be food or people around. And then one of the more novel application methods that uh, we've been hearing a lot about, we've been seeing companies tout this in videos and, and put out commercials showing that they're using this, is an electrostatic sprayer. So we get a lot of questions around, what is this electrostatic sprayer? Is this the silver bullet we've all been waiting for? Um, and you know, we're here to say that it's a great application method when used correctly, uh, but it def definitely has its own place. So again, not a one-size-fits-all approach. Pick your application based on what you're trying to do. Um, electrostatic sprayers are powered typically by a battery, so they're, they're cordless. They have hand sprayers, but also backpack versions. And uh, when the product comes out of the tip of this, it gives it a slight charge. And what this kind of allows is the spreading of the product. So all the all the droplets that come out have the same charge. They you know they don't they aren't attracted to each other, but instead they're attracted to the surfaces around them. So you get this kind of uniform, comprehensive coverage of your environmental surfaces uh, because the droplets are repelling each other. This can increase the efficiency of application and allow for coverage in large areas. Um, but it does require additional PPE and some modified procedures for safe use. So especially, especially in areas that might have food or food contact surfaces, we want to be really careful about using this application type. Um, it may be better suited as an intermittent application type in food service. Uh, you know, during periods, if you do a deep cleaning once a month or once a quarter or annually, um, maybe this would be a good tool to employ during that time. And really, really the most important thing is we would not recommend this application type when patrons are present. Um, you have to wear a special PPE covering your mouth and nose just to make sure that you're not in inhaling any of that product. Uh, if you are considering the, the use of this type of tool, please reach out to your Ecolab rep. We have some more in-depth uh, guidance that we're happy to provide for you. And then I did want to note that if you're applying a sanitizer or disinfectant through an electrostatic sprayer, um, it really doesn't replace the need for manual cleaning. So the devices don't remove soil or debris or blood or bodily fluids. Uh, they really help apply the product wide, widely and, and uh, give you a nice even coverage, which is one of the benefits of using it. Um, but it should be in addition to and not in place of that manual cleaning and disinfection. All right, moving on to some more food service focused applications. So uh, the top two are related to the product that I mentioned that's been launched and these will come out later in Q4. So we have a new sanitizer bucket. I'm sure you all have many sanitizer buckets, but we have a new style um, that has a really cool component to it where it can show visual confirmation of efficacy. So it has a little test strip in a window. And you, you can actually just look at the test strip in the window and see like, oh, is my product still viable? Can I still use this in front of house? Or should I swap out that product? The other one is disposable wipe system. So this is like a dry round of wipes that's housed in a, in a plastic container and the container can be reused. You just order new dry wipes. 
um, and you can douse the dry wipes with your chemistry and then use the wipes. And this gives us a little bit of flexibility and convenience when we're cleaning. Um, you know, not everyone wants to slug around a, a sanitizer bucket, so this would be a great option as well. Those won't be available till late in 2020, but I did want to mention them here. And then finally, three compartment sink. You're probably like, yeah, we all know what this is. We've all used this. We use it every single day. Um, but the reason I included it is I really wanted to call out the consideration here. Uh, this is a great you know, application method. Um, it does what it's supposed to do when it's used properly. So the, you know, one of the biggest um, issues we see here from a procedural standpoint is that the uh, immersion in the sanitizer or the third sink, so the sanitizer solution, is too brief, and they're not actually getting that complete contact time required to kill off any of those infectious bacteria. So make sure that your staff, again, is trained well on how to use this tool, um, and it can, it can be really helpful for kind of those bigger prep wear things that don't fit in the dish machine. All right, tableware. So this is another question we get a lot. You know, should we go to everything disposable? We have these sustainability goals. How do we kind of manage these two uh, while still making sure that our, our guests can remain safe when they eat in our establishment? So let's talk through some of the stuff that sits on the table. You know, pr prior to COVID, you maybe had a lot of stuff sitting on your tables. You'd have, you know, condiments, extra silverware, napkins, um, extra menus, things that may just sit there. And that's, that's kind of for convenience for your customers, that's where they were. But this might be a time to minimize what's offered on those tables, remove things that are not necessary, um, or provide single-use items. So maybe you swap out that, you know, that uh, ketchup container for individual packets, and that would be a great way to show your guests, hey, we're thinking about this and we're making sure that you're going to stay safe when you eat here. Um, reusable wear is still perfectly acceptable to use as long as you're following those standard procedures, wash, rinse, sanitize, uh, either through your dish machine or through that three compartment sink. But we would recommend handling wear minimally after it's been washed. So this just ensures that it stays hygienic and, and your uh, guests will have a great experience. And then as far as table linens go, so a lot of you may have already removed these, but um, if you are going to keep them, you know, if it's a higher end restaurant, a lot of times people go there and they like to be pampered with that cloth napkin. So we would recommend laundering those items between guests, uh, including the tablecloth, or, you know, here you could replace with a single use uh, disposable item. Okay. So on the note of uh, soft or porous surfaces like a tablecloth or a a cloth napkin, um, we do get this question a lot. You tell us over and over, you can disinfect these hard non-porous surfaces, but what about the porous surfaces like my booth or like my chairs uh, that are upholstered, my carpet, what do I do with that? Um, you know, people are really concerned about treating every single surface in their establishment. So in terms of soft or porous surfaces, the good news is that uh, initial research has shown us this virus only survives about 24 hours on soft surfaces. So that's good news. Um, and so kind of with that in mind, CDC has recommended the following for handling soft surfaces. Um, if it's something like an upholstered item that can't be laundered, you can, you know, remove any visible contamination. If someone is ill in your restaurant, obviously remove those soils before moving on. But cleaning the surface using soap and water or your normal upholstery cleaner uh, is a great option. If you're going to test out a new product, make sure you're testing that in an inconspicuous location first so that you're not damaging any of those soft surfaces. If the item can be laundered, this is definitely the best practice. So those tablecloths, those cloth napkins, um, those can be removed and laundered. Uh, and the process of laundering does actually get us to hygienically clean linen. And so they should be just fine to reuse uh, for your next guests once they've been properly washed and completely dried. And then if you have carpeted floors or carpeted areas of your uh, establishment, you can vacuum those as usual. Um, you know, a best practice may be to vacuum when there aren't a lot of patrons around. So in the evenings, in the mornings, between kind of uh, the big waves of people coming in, just in the off chance that there's any viral particles kind of spit up into the air. Um, and if you have a vacuum with a HEPA filter, that might also be a great option. All right, so we've talked through environmental hygiene and really how important a component it is. I think you all know that um, really, really well by this point. But in these COVID times, not only is it important to implement this enhanced uh, environmental hygiene, but it's really critical to do so when it's visible to your customers. So you may have heard the term clean theater or 
you know, um, there, there's a lot of ways that people kind of talk about this, but really a, a best practice to restore that trust with your customers is making sure they see you doing these enhanced hygiene procedures. Um, you know, making sure before you seat the next the next guest at a table that they see you wiping it down and maybe waiting for your one minute contact time for that sanitizer before you're allowing them to sit. You can communicate these new standards uh, and protocols that you've implemented through a number of ways. This could be on-site signage. This could be a memo that you send out or a welcome back letter uh, when you reopen. You know, social media is a great option for these types of uh, communications because this is the way that people are looking to see, hey, you know, I'm feeling like we're in an okay spot. I want to go out for, you know, my birthday dinner. We've been home for six months. Um, but let me do a little research on what these restaurants are saying they're actually doing and then do what you're saying you, you, you're doing. So when they come, they see you. They see the hand sanitizer station at the front. They have the option to use that. Um, you know, all those little touches really, really make a difference and reassure your guests that you're with the time, you're being proactive and, and that they can eat there um, and, and can continue coming back. So you put in a lot of extra effort, make sure it's uh, well communicated. So that's kind of all we have for you today. Um, thank you so much for your time. I know time is of the essence right now. Everyone has, you know, is triple booked, has lots of stuff going on. So uh, I wanted to mention a couple of resources we have available. We have a COVID-19 response and recovery research, resource page specifically for food service. If you go to ecolab.com backslash coronavirus, you can click on your specific market. Uh, we have video content. We have previous webinars. We have checklists, procedures. Um, pretty much you name it, we have it. So feel free to check that out. And these resources are really meant to help you prepare your environment, enable your staff, and assure your customers. And then we also have many food safety specific uh, resources as well. You can find all these food safety resources at ecolab.com. So without further ado, Mandy, right. do we have any additional questions? We do, we have a lot. So thank you, Casey, that was great. And to both of you, Ed and Casey, before we move into Q&A, I wanted to make sure to uh, thank you for this presentation. A few people have asked if the presentation will be available, and the answer is yes, and uh, we will share the presentation and the slides mm -hmm. on the Ecolab webinar website. Uh, so uh, look out for that um, after um, this is done. So Casey, let's start with you for a couple of the questions. Uh, you mentioned sure. a lot about liquid um, disinfectants. Uh, what about alternate application methods like UV, ozone, or air purifiers? Are, are they as effective against yeah. uh, COVID-19? Okay. This is a great, great question and one that we get a lot. So um, EPA has, you know, done a really nice job educating end users on the, the appropriate products to use to address any concerns around SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. So ozone generators, UV lights, and air purifiers, because they're not a liquid disinfecting chemistry, they actually fall into a different bucket. Those are considered um, pesticidal devices. And EPA doesn't routinely review any of the safety or, or efficacy related to those products. Um, that's done at the state level. And so what that means is there's not federal oversight on you know, the claims that, that come out uh, along with these products. So while they may be effective, um, there isn't as much kind of rigor around how they are reviewed. So our recommendation, and, and it aligns with EPA's recommendation, is to continue using those liquid disinfectants. And maybe you supplement with a UV light or you supplement with um, some additional offering, kind of uh, a, a one-two punch, if you will. Excellent, thank you. Um, Ed, uh, we had a question come in um, that I think uh, was meant for you. Um, you mentioned that the two major modes of transmission for COVID-19 are both air droplets and contaminated surfaces. Uh, do we know what approximate percentages there are uh, for each method, for the spread of each method? Yeah, that's a great question, Mandy. And, and I will say we don't know the actual percentages However, we will say that um, based on CDC guidance, uh, the mode of transmission that is more prevalent than the other is droplets through the air, which is why physical distancing, mask wearing are very, very important. Um, surface contamination and getting sick from surfaces is not very well documented and considered 
um, a much lower risk. However, there's still risk associated with it. So, um, like I said, through the air, mm -hmm. through droplets is the most common method of transmission at this point that we know of. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, with both of your answers, just the last two, we see that it's a combination of multiple things mm -hmm. um, that are really helping in the prevention of transmission. Um, Casey, a lot of questions have come through about the smart power sink and surface sanitizer. Um, they are the name of the product, how is it applied, and what's the active ingredient? I'm wondering if you want to either go back to slide 23 um, or uh, review some of that information, um, and certainly we can let the, the members know where to find more information if they need to, but if you could please review that one more time, I think that would be helpful since we had so many questions on it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, so this product could not have come at a better time. It's, uh, you know, it really is, was formulated to address the concerns around norovirus, um, but because we put this emerging viral pathogen claim on it, we are able to leverage that for SARS-CoV-2 at food, con uh, food safe um, levels, which is kind of novel. So the product is called Smart Power Sink and Surface Cleaner Sanitizer. Um, it is available to order right now through Ecolab or, uh, you know, even through some specific distributors. Um, so if you use a distributor, definitely ask. If you have an Ecolab rep, definitely reach out to them and see, you know, how quickly they can get it installed for you. Um, it comes in a variety of pack sizes. And it, the, the other really cool thing about it is it kind of has flexibility in how it can be applied. So it can be used in front of house through your sanitizer bucket uh, and eventually through those dry wipe system that I talked about. Um, but also it can be used in the third sink. So it's uh, pretty versatile and, you know, allows for, um, you know, really streamlining those procedures. The test strips work. You can test it at any temperature, which is uh, also another thing that I know can be a challenge in food service. So, um, yeah, we've had uh, really good feedback about the product, um, and it's, it's, uh, there's plenty of it. So if you're interested, do reach out to your Ecolab rep. Did I answer all the questions, awesome. Andy? I think there was one about yeah. active. It has a dual the active. active uh, yeah, it's a dual active. So um, it's it's not a quad or your standard uh, sanitizer that you'd think of. It's a it's a dual active. Thank you. And we will put that information on for everybody because there has been more information about the bucket and all of this new. Um, it's exciting the new product. So thank you, um, Ed. I have mm -hmm. a question for you on masks. Okay. Um, what kind of masks would you recommend? And tell about change in frequency. Uh, one mask per day, or when would you change them? Yeah, so why don't we go right to the source here and look at what the CDC recommends. Um, so uh, what they do recommend when you're selecting a mask is to select a mask with two layers or more. Um, so that's one consideration. Um, let's see. So, do not wear masks intended for healthcare workers. So, N95 masks, and I, I believe the recommendation is there because they want to save those for the healthcare workers, so they don't have a shortage. Um, but still, that's that's the recommendation. And then they do not recommend the use of gaiters or face shields. Um, there is research ongoing on these today, um, but until the effectiveness is known, it's not part of the recommendation. So, a standard face mask. Um, is recommended, and then it should be washed frequently, so likely um, at the end of the day it should be washed. But we should, what you should do is inspect it for rips, tears. Um, is it hard to breathe through it? Is it really dirty? You might have to dispose of it at that point, but, um, but you can launder them, and when you do launder them, launder them at the hottest temperature allowed by the fabric. Um, so once it's laundered, again, it can be reused, and um, the only uh, recommendation that I see for actually getting rid of the mask is, like I said, if it's damaged in any way. Okay, excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, would you also have any recommendations on what to do with the mask uh, while you are actually tasting food or uh, someone mentioned hydrating, so drinking sodas or waters uh, while you're working and, and when to wash your hands um, when you're doing this? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question, Mandy. So I, I'd say, I mean, once you you know want to taste food or hydrate, you're going to have to remove the mask, which typically requires washing your hands. Um, you know, store the mask in a place where it's not you know in contact with high touch point surfaces, um, hang it from your ear, uh, you know, something like that. And then when you're done tasting food or you're done hydrating, 
um, you can then reapply the mask and wash your hands again and prepare for your next uh, adventure, if you will. So again, okay. washing your hands is very important here, both before taking it off so you don't infect yourself and then after putting it back on so you don't infect others. Excellent, thank you, thank you. That is a great question. Um, a few questions about um, sanitizers and disinfectants. Um, when we talk about, uh, this is for you, Casey, when we talk about sanitizers and disinfectants on tables, is there a um, certain cloth that's recommended uh, for use when using them? Yeah, so microfiber is a great option. Um, microfiber cloths have a lot of nooks and crannies and they can kind of gather up, you know, organisms, leftover soil, whatever is kind of left on the surface. So we would recommend microfiber um, if you have it available. But, you know, really the, the product should specify if you can use it in that way with a, you know, I'm not sure if they mean soaking the cloth and then using it, uh, applying it in that way or spraying it and using a cloth. But regardless, um, I would say microfiber is probably the best option. Okay, great, thank you. They did ask in, in both ways, so that's excellent. We appreciate it. Um, there are quite a few more questions. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do is to put some Q&A um, sections on the slides that we send out that we've promised will be available. We'll make sure that we answer them. Um, if there are more, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I, you can reach out to me as well. Uh, my email, uh, mandy.sedlec at ecolab.com, and we can help you answer those. I'll certainly pass them on to Casey and Ed. Um, before we um, end, I want to make sure that I let you know about next week's webinar. Um, this is the third, and next week is our fourth in the series. It's the Food and Dining Future State, and we're very excited to have Lisa Robinson, our Vice President of Global Food Safety and Public Health at Ecolab Moderate. And we have three awesome um, industry panelists that we will have. We have uh, Bethy Politis from Starbucks, Doug Davis with Marriott, and Dan Goldberg with BJ's. So if you have time um, next Wednesday, September 30th at two o'clock Eastern time, please join us. Um, we also have the past webinars available uh, for watching on demand, as we mentioned, all four will be available at the end of the series. Well, I think that that's all we have today. We really appreciate your time, as Casey said, and Casey and Ed, thank you for your technical expertise and your time as well. Uh, everybody have a wonderful day, and please stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>